friend in ministry who likes to say that as Christians, we are not heroes. We are warriors. We are not people that are going to get glory for doing the thing that we do. What we do is what is expected of us. As Christians, we have a hero, and that hero is Christ. That's why we're Christians. That's why we're Christ-like. We want to be like our hero. He won the battle before most of us were ever out on the field, swinging a sword, trying to win. So tonight I want us to think, you know, if I am a Christian, if I am a warrior for God, what is my function? What kind of warrior do I want to be? We can start out tonight, if you would, turn me to the book of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3. I love what Paul says here in the book of Philippians, in chapter 3, starting in verse 13. He says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul's writing here to this church that is very dear to them, and he's trying to instruct them on how they should live. And he tells them, brethren, one thing, one thing I do. I strain towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As Christians, we really only have one function. We really only have one thing that we do. It is our job to keep our eyes heavenward and to strive towards this upward call. And when we do that, we bring others with, that, with us. When we do that, we fight the good fight. And when I think of men in Scripture that embodied this idea of striving towards heaven, of keeping their eyes single-mindedly on that goal, I think of Barnabas. So tonight, that's who I want us to look at. You know, we often think of Barnabas, and we think of him as being that traditional, stereotypical, nice guy. I mean, he's Barnabas. He's the son of encouragement. So being friendly, obviously, probably came easy to him. That's our thought a lot of the time. But tonight, I want to encourage you to see Barnabas a little bit different and see him as a soldier for God. We're going to look at three examples in his life, and you can start turning to Acts 4. That's the first place we're going to look. Here in Acts 4, just to keep in mind what's going on, the church has just kind of come together. And things are about as perfect as they're ever going to be in the church. Things are wonderful. The brethren are getting along, and the church is growing. It's powerful. And this is what Luke records for us in Acts 4, starting in verse 32. He says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owner of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is our first look at Barnabas in Scripture. We see him, and he goes and he sells this field, and he gives the money to the apostles. I think we see some things about Barnabas right here. Even though not much is said about who he is, we know what he does. The first thing we see is that he trusts God's providence. He trusts God's will for the things that we give to God. He trusts God enough to give him something. Not only does he trust God, he trusts the men that God puts in charge. You know, that's essential for us as Christians. We have to trust that the people that God has put into this church to lead this church are going to take the gifts that we give and use them. And I have full faith that we have some wonderful people here at Beltline that do that. But I think that says a lot about Barnabas' character. He had faith in God, and he had faith in the men that he put in charge. The next thing we see is, practically, we see Barnabas' priorities. We see that this was a man who had God first. God first, God second, God third, and himself last. He was concerned about the church, and he was concerned about its growth, about its welfare, about what he could do to contribute to it. Now, the first, we see here that he's given this name of Barnabas. And the ESV translates it, son of encouragement. But I kind of like how the King James translates it. It calls it the son of consolation. Some other translations call it the son of comfort. This is amazing to me. You know, we read this, and a lot of the time, we just read right over it. That was his name. It was Barnabas. He was encouraging. But think about who gave him this nickname. The apostles, men that spent years with Jesus in ministry, at the most stressful time in history, 
They're sitting here, they're starting the church. I can't imagine a more difficult thing, trying to get all this in line, all the pressure they had to be under. And Barnabas comes up to him, and I don't know if it was the way that he gave them the gift or his demeanor or what it was, but they call him the son of encouragement, the son of consolation. He comforted Jesus' disciples. It's amazing what we can do as Christians when we honor God and we put him first in our lives. So often we underestimate the power of our gift. You know, we plant a seed as Christians, and we often don't realize that that thing can grow, and it can become amazing. And God showed that in the life of Barnabas. And when we think about Barnabas, I think it's, it's important that we consider his motivations. You know, Steve said this morning in his, sermon, in his sermon that real Christianity transforms motivations. And when we look at Barnabas' gift, we probably often kind of write it off as he was just a nice guy. He was willing to give some to the church. It didn't hurt him that bad. We see him later, and he's obviously okay. But I don't want you to miss how great a gift this is. Could you imagine going and selling a house, going and selling a great piece of property, and all the money that you would get from that and just giving it away, not having anything from it, not having that security? Barnabas was willing to do that. And I think he was willing to do that because his motivations were transformed, because he felt something different than just you know, care for the church different than just love. He felt duty to God to serve him to the best of his ability. You know, I, uh, I had a friend growing up in Mississippi. This guy, when he was 14 years old, he moved out of his parents' house in a very rough household when he was growing up, a rough childhood. At 14 years old, he moved out, he built himself a house, and he started laying brick. I can't imagine how he did it, but he did. And he hated it. But he continued to do it, and 10 years later, you look at this man's life, and he is successful. He's got a wonderful family, and he is happy. Well, like things often do, things go a little difficult, and he loses this successful job that he has, and he has to turn to something else. And he starts laying brick again. And even though he does not enjoy it, he absolutely hates it, you see this man is still happy. And people often go up to him, and they ask him, you know, why are you so happy? I know this makes you miserable. I know this is hard work. How can you smile in the midst of this? And he would tell people that it's because I love my family. It's because I love my family so much that I will do this. I will do anything that I have to to care for them, to show them how much I love them, to put them before myself. As Christians, how much do we love God? How much are we honestly willing to give him? How often do we stop at the first little bit of difficulty, at the first problem that we encounter and say, this is too hard. God, I can't do this. You've got to make this a little easier. Do we love him enough to work? Do we love him enough to work in unpleasant circumstances? Turn with me to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, in verse, starting in verse 4, we see one of the most important texts of the Old Testament, one of the most, most important texts of the entire Bible. It's kind of like the, uh, the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. And Jesus referred to it as the greatest command. But in Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 4, God tells the people of Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with your, all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. If God is first, and God is second, and God is third in our life, if we are last, this is the way that we are going to consider God. He is going to be in our hearts. He is going to be our priority. We are going to be willing to sacrifice for him. As Christians, we need to have our priorities straight. That's part of being a Christian. We have to be careful about how we treat each other as well. I love that Barnabas was able to comfort people. And I would encourage you to never underestimate the power and the value of your presence and your ability to comfort others. You know, I've got uh, several friends that work in youth ministry, and they are all about what they call the power of presence. They say, you know, if I can just get the kids to show up, just two or three that are having problems coming, if they'll show up, the entire group changes. The entire group gets happier. The entire group works harder. Because it's amazing what we can do by just being there. As Christians, we have power to encourage. And that's not just something that we can do. It's something that we should do. It is a kingdom work. It is something that we are commanded to do. We are supposed to love one another as we love ourselves. 
We have to examine our motivations as Christians. You know, are we doing these things because they are easy? Or are we doing these things because they are right? So often we come to church on Sunday because that is easy. But what do we do throughout the week? What is our guiding light in life? Are we keeping that one thing in mind? Are we looking towards heaven? Or are we thinking about, you know, how am I going to get the bigger house? How am I going to pay for the bills? How am I going to get a nicer car than the one I'm driving right now? What is our worry? What is our focus? Barnabas knew how to keep track of these things. And I would encourage you to consider them in your own life. The next part of Barnabas' life I want us to go to is in Acts 9. In Acts 9, in verse 26 through 28, that's what we're going to look at, we see that the Apostle Paul has come to Jerusalem and he is attempting to contact the Apostles. And understandably, he's having a little bit of difficulty. But in Acts 9, starting in verse 26 through verse 28, it says, and he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. This is by far my favorite thing about Barnabas. He was a man that knew how to build bridges. He was a, new, a man that knew the importance of bringing people to God. You know, it's amazing. We just saw how he got this nickname, how he was a comfort to the apostles. This was an important reputation to have for Barnabas. I mean, you see that we don't see him referred to by his name. It's always this nickname for the rest of Scripture. This man was known as an encourager, and he risked that reputation to go and bring an infamous committer of hate crimes against Christians to the leaders of the Christians. He risked that, and it's amazing to me that he would be willing to do that. And if you think about it, I think the reason had to be that Paul believed, or Barnabas believed that Paul was valuable to the kingdom. He believed that Paul could make a difference. He had seen him preaching, he had seen him working, and he knew that that needed to be in God's church, that needed to be in God's kingdom. Barnabas' ministry is a hinge in Scripture. Every person that he encounters that we see is strengthened. Every person that we, he encounters is taken away from a, a more worldly side of life and brought closer to God. These people depended on, on his encouragement. You see, with the apostles, he changed them. He helped them. He encouraged them. With Paul, he brought him into a chance to start these missionary journeys and to work with the church. As Christians, we can learn from that. We can be hinges. We must learn to vouch for people and to choose to believe in the good nature of others and to get them involved in the church. You know, at Heritage, that's where I go. It's a school I go to for ministry. They talk a lot about ministry today, about how we can strengthen the church and this culture that we live in. And the funny thing is, a lot of the times they say, you know, what you do on Sundays is not necessarily as important as what you're going to do throughout the week. If you want to bring people to God, if you want to strengthen the church, you've got to start with your relationships. You've got to start with your attitude. You know, so often in our friendships, we have this me, me, me attitude. We have friends and we try to make sure that they're there for us. We try to make sure that, you know, the people that we can really count on are the people we really care about. As Christians, we need to be having a them attitude. We need to be caring about them and trying to be there when they need us. As Christians, we are a bridge. Like Barnabas was a bridge to Paul that brought him to the apostles, we are a bridge to a broken world. And we are supposed to bring it to God. And we are supposed to bring God to this broken world. How we heal broken hearts, broken homes, all these things that the world struggles with. It's not by preaching a message. It's by compassion. It's by love. It's by being the Christian that we claim to be. And it's through the relationships that we forge. And Barnabas was a great example of that. That's why he was called a son of encouragement. The final part of Barnabas' ministry that I want us to look at tonight is in Acts 15. This is probably the most well-known part of Barnabas' ministry, and it's probably the one that preachers talk about the most. So, I'm pretty sure you've heard it before, but I reckon we can check it out again, see if we can learn something. But in Acts 15, starting in verse 36, it says, And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, 
But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them 